right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM. Joining you from lovely blue sky in San Diego. And today I'm actually joined by Paul Ross, who is also under the very same blue sky here in San Diego. How are you doing, Paul? Wonderful to be here. I love the opportunity to be an educator and a teacher and a guide. It's what I love most in life. So thank you. And thank you to your audience for this opportunity to yeah, give them absolutely. some pretty mind blowing outside of the box stuff they won't find off the shelf. <laughs> yeah. Well, the only where the only place they will find it off the shelf is in Paul's book, uh, Subtle Words That Sell. So um, Paul is the author. There's the book. All right, Paul, um, you said uh, in, in your book or the, the, the blurb for your book, you say, are you tired of the same worn out sales scripts, assumed closes, tag questions and other stale nonsense that no longer work, insult your prospects intelligence and make you feel like a schmuck <laughs> all in one go, which is a pretty good achievement to achieve all those things. In one go. But, um, so, so from your point of view, um, what should people be doing differently? Well, here's the thing. I don't want to say that all traditional sales training mm -hmm. is, is crapola or that it doesn't work. The problem is that your prospect nowadays has a different psychology, which is they're both dumbed down and numbed out and distracted. People nowadays have the attention span of a goldfish. I remember when I started watching YouTube, the ads were two minutes long. Now they're 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're very sophisticated. They've seen your pitches before. So what's different in my approach is we're using subconscious languaging. We're appealing to the unconscious or subconscious mind and bypassing the traditional conscious mind that uses facts, data, figures. Because we know, and the studies have shown this, that most of our decisions are made on the unconscious level anyway. We use the facts, right. data, and figures to rationalize it. So why not go straight to the boss and skip past the part that's gonna be worried about the facts, data, and figures? First, get the unconscious convinced, and then you can present the facts, data, and numbers. So, um, I mean, obviously, uh, traditionally, people kind of start to lead with, as you say, with the, the facts and the data, and it's where a lot of people are, are comfortable. But I think, uh, to your point, I think even now, because we've been through this, uh, you know, huge event, world event, uh, with the pandemic and everything else is going along, uh, that has gone along with it, and the and things that have happened since, I think people are maybe a little bit more sensitive or attuned emotionally than ever before right now. So what you're talking about may actually um, be more effective than ever. You're actually bringing up a very good point, which is one of my principles is that before you worry about the actions you want your prospect to take first think what state of consciousness do you want them to be mm -hmm. in the idea of sales being about engineering states of consciousness about expanding consciousness is a pretty whacked out bat bleep crazy idea but for example if your prospect is coming to you distracted or overwhelmed how can you get them in a state where they're focused and they already trust and believe in you within the first minute of conversation now one of my outrageous crazy claims is that within the first two minutes of your sales presentation you can create unbreakable trust and rapport and have them completely willing to give what you say if not a fair hearing even to go beyond that and believe you and i can share mm -hmm. that thing here if you yeah like. no no do because i mean most people would uh you know would say that okay trust is critical but trust is built over time and it's a it's accumulation of a lot of uh, you know data points as you deliver on the things that you say you will that's, so you tell me go ahead and tell me how you do it that's traditional sales training yes so there are four words i teach that are called implied relationship words and they go traditional sales training a, a traditional presentation would be well as i'm showing you the marketing plan i want you to notice that we get 10 percent more listings in your neighborhood i'm just using real estate i work with all sorts yeah. of six seven figure sales people but as i'm showing you our our marketing plan you may notice that We've gotten so many listings in your neighborhood at 50% more, price, whatever it is. The problem with that is it's something you're doing to them. You're showing that mm -hmm. to them. I use yeah. four re implied relationships words. It would go like this. As we explore this together, I'm not sure at which point 
you'd like to share the questions that naturally arise when a great decision is going to be made, but I invite you to do so. So as we explore this together, we and together imply a relationship. So instead mm -hmm. of saying, as I show this to you, I say, as we explore this together, so we and together and explore, and exploration is something you do together. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. explore together, I invite you. Do you extend an invitation to someone who you don't have a relationship with? No. Yeah. And I didn't say to ask the questions, I said to share the questions. What's the difference between asking and sharing? It's a big difference. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. So uh, my outrageous claim is within a minute or two, you can create that trust and that rapport right away. You don't have to build it through data points. People don't have the attention and the time span anyway anymore f to mm -hmm. build things over time. You need to get it right away. Yeah, yeah I know. I, and I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I like that. I like that approach because immediately you have taken what is naturally often a um, it's an adversarial um, situation, and I don't mean that in 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 a in extreme or overt form. But you know, your defenses are a little bit up when there's a salesperson, you know, customer interaction going on. So by what you've just said, you have taken away all of that and said, "Okay, I'm not selling something to you. We're exploring something together." Now, there's one more thing that's cleverly implied. Mm -hmm. If I'm going on an exploration with you, and and I'm going to be the one who's leading the exploration. So that implies leadership. And if there's a leader, there has to be a what? And it starts with the letter F. A follower. That's correct. So through double implication, through implying leadership, you have a double implication, which is follower. And followers have to do what? It starts with the T word. It starts with Trust. a T. That's exactly right. So now on multiple levels, you're using implication and suggestion. Yeah. So how much money am I up to now on this game show? Because I've got some <laughs> questions, right? <laughs> it's free. I love teaching it. If, there, if I could do it, I would pay people to come hear me teach because I love it so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is a this is, and as you said, I mean, people don't have the time to build this now, so that you're you're immediately cutting through the noise, and 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 I think it's really at the end of the day what you're talking about here is taking away the stress from this situation, and make, and it's almost like you're making it enjoyable. Well, here's the thing: many of my students and clients come back to me and say, you know what, Paul, this not only increase my percentages by 30, 40, 50%, but it was more fun than anything I've ever yeah. seen before. This is my claim that you can not only do far better than you ever realized, but you can make selling fun. What if selling mm -hmm. was something, not just a job, but you got up every day and thought, this is so much fun. I can't wait to do it. And that's the cool yeah. thing. Cause you get to see people as you lead their imagination that you can see the responses are really, really strong and it, and it makes it fun. By the way, I should say that I have my 11th month old kitten asleep in my lap. So yeah, occasionally yeah, yeah. I look down, it's because she's stirring in her sleep. <laughs> um, and clearly you have developed a trust relationship there. So there you go. Shows oh, it works. Yeah, she's the boss. <laughs> and let's, yeah, and let's face it, you know, cats, cats don't give their trust um, readily. It has to be earned. Um, so, okay, so back to what we're talking about, says so uh, this idea of enjoying the enjoying doing what you're doing, right, and enjoying selling, and this is something that is is contagious in many ways, because at the end of the day, I want to engage with the salesperson who seems to enjoy what they're doing, who really believes right. in what they're doing, who Correct. who not somebody who I think, uh, I bet you they you know they don't even seem to believe in their product. I don't know why they're trying to sell it to me. Well, you're never selling your product. Mm -hmm. You're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. In fact, here's a reframe for all you salespeople out there. If you want to get much better as a salesperson, paradoxically, stop thinking of yourself as a salesperson. Think of yourself as a decision service technician, because I'll hammer the point again. Unless you have something like wireless transmission of power or cold fusion or anti-gravity, essentially what you're selling is a commodity like rice. Mm -hmm. So really what you're selling is that decision and that good feeling about decisions. So paradoxically, look at yourself as a decision service technician. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're doing. 
So then, um, so once you have established that rapport and uh, you, you've got them to come along with you on the journey, etc., how do you ensure that you can make that journey a, a smooth one and a good one and you don't just like start the journey and then everything falls apart? Good question. Well, one of the key skills is to calibrate, to watch to see mm -hmm. that they're in that state of focus, that they're continuing to pay attention to you. And again, you can precede that through the way you use suggestion at the very beginning of the conversation. But the other thing, and I really want to make a very controversial point, you, I think you mentioned rapport. Sometimes rapport is overrated. Sometimes you need to break rapport to make mm -hmm. the sale. Now that's also a crazy idea. But just for example, when an objection comes up, so often salespeople are trying to be people pleasers and, oh, I understand, Mr. Smith, what can I do to clear this up for you? I really want you to feel comfortable moving ahead today. Sometimes you need to break rapport. May I give an example? Sure. Classic objection. This is one of my favorite, this is my single, I teach a lot of mm -hmm. different topics on sales, but my favorite is destroying objections. If you get the objection, I need more time to think it over. I would use a counter example. I would say, have you ever taken a long time to think something over and it still turned out to be the wrong decision? Okay. Now that's breaking rapport right there. It's completely mm -hmm. shattering the rapport. And here's the key about rapport. If you break rapport, once you get rapport back, you strengthen the rapport. It's a principle from hypnosis, and I'm a classically trained hypnotist called right. fractionation. So if I put someone in a deep trance and just keep sending them deeper, they can only do so much. But if I pull them back out of trance, each and every time they go back in, they go back in a little bit more responsive. Mm. So sometimes you have to break rapport to maintain it. You have to shock the client out of their objection. And in many ways, I mean, I think, as you said, I mean, that uh, what you just said there reinforces the rapport or the trust because you haven't just been a yes person or you just you haven't just kind of placated them and or come up with sort of, yeah, you know, I, I understand, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I understand you need more time and I'm happy to give you more time. But uh, yeah. I mean, then then you're going the opposite direction, right? If you want to be a good salesperson, you know how to get people to like you. If you want to be a champion salesperson, you have to be able to handle those brief moments where they may not like you and you may yeah. have to confront them. Best salespeople know how to be confrontational without being rude or nasty. Mm -hmm. And the best yeah, way to confront, the best way to confront is to break that pattern, break people's traditional pattern of answering. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, in order to do that, then you, uh, you know, you have to have a certain level of confidence in, in yourself, right? So, I mean, a lot of this starts off with your own mental uh, mindset and your own kind of fortitude. Correct. And I learned a lot about mindset. It's not in my biography, but I'm a former dating coach. And oddly oh, really? enough, I took, a, yeah, I took a lot of what I learned from coaching <laughs> men about dating and applied it to confidence and sales because I used to take guys who are 30, 40 years old and never had a date, how to teach them how to have confidence. And the number one thing that I would teach salespeople also implies to dating which is be interested in the date, be interested in the sale, but be invested in your skills. Most salespeople right. have the back ass words. They're, and forgive the street noise, I, I apologize. No, no, no worries. Most salespeople who are stuck at a certain level, they're invested in that sale, but they're only interested in their skills. So I say be invested in your skills and just interested in the sale. That's how you make big leaps. Yeah, so it just, just um, elaborate a little bit more on that. So how, if somebody was listening and said, oh, so how do I become more invested in my skills? I'll give a metaphor if I can. I teach a lot through metaphor. Yeah. And a breakfast of bacon and eggs, the pig is invested, the chicken is interested. <laughs> but to get, to get beyond that, you have to take on what I call learning confidence. Yeah. There's, people say you need to be more confident as a salesperson, but no one really unpacks deeply what that means. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick the right kind of confidence. There's rehearsal confidence. That's what all the books teach you. Imagine the way you'd want to speak. Say, I'm confident. I am confident in front of the mirror. There's performance confidence. You've done things a thousand times before very well. 1,001, you expect you'll do well. 
but for most people who haven't reached the level they want to reach, I think it's important to have learning confidence, which simply mm -hmm. means you're totally confident that your learning strategy will enable you to pick up everything you need to know to get where you need to go the next time. Learning confidence relies upon having a good learning strategy. One of the things I say in my mindset trainings is, you don't have a confidence or a discipline problem, you have a crappy learning strategy. Actually, I use a different word than crappy, but I won't say it on your show. Sure, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, and, I, and I mean, it's, a, it's a fascinating point because I think a lot of people, and this isn't just salespeople, but this is people in, in any role in general, is they reach a certain point where they think, uh, yeah, I've been doing this long enough. I don't really need to invest in myself anymore. I don't really need to train myself. And they just think I can just do it. Yeah, I've been doing it for so long, I can do it. And that's kind of, that's just the wrong approach, isn't it? Because let's face it, if you do practically anything else you do in your life, you know, your hobbies or whatever, if you want to get good at it, you keep practicing and you keep probably paying people to help you. I've invested so much money in coaching and the top clients I have have invested in coaching. Really, mm -hmm. you're investing in yourself. Yeah. And I don't, and here's the funny thing. I don't work with people who are doing mediocre. I only work with people who are already doing pretty damn good. And right, they right. want to get, they want to beat their personal best. And they want to beat the competition. They've got a competitive edge, both with themselves and they have a competitive edge on the other people out there. And I think champions are always on the competitive edge, if not with other people, then with themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's very can you be, but can, oh, forgive me, but can you be competitive mm -hmm but unattached to the outcome. Ah, that's the real secret. That's something that I claim I can teach. To be competitive with yourself, but unattached to the outcome. That's the paradox. So what is it? So explain what that means. So how do you detach yourself from the outcome? Well, again, you need to be able to look at the results from a state of what I call witness consciousness. This is really diving deep. I'm going to take a deep dive with you because you ask great, and this is only my model. It's not sure. true with a capital T. It's just my model, my map. It's worked for me. It's worked for thousands of students. There's creative consciousness. That's tapping into your intuition, your dreams, etc. There's will consciousness. That's focusing, not letting go of your goals, moving forward, even though there's a lot of pain and setbacks. But then there's witness consciousness, the ability to look at what you're doing with clarity and courage and see exactly what's going on, to examine it at every level and first and foremost to say, what did I do that worked? What could I have done differently? What could I have added in? If I was already really, really great at this, if I had already mastered the skills, what would I have done differently? Excuse mm. me a minute. Perfect. The inconvenient ear itch. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so this is just a synopsis of something that would take me a weekend to teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's in, it's so it, it's it's interesting again is that it, a lot of what you're talking about here really, and um, it's nothing to do with. I mean, it's everything to do with sales, but it's nothing to do with, as you said, like traditional sales skill. This is everything to do really with self discovery, self awareness, and really working on yourself. And correct, and those are the people I love to have as clients. They're people it's great to want to learn about selling and, and double your mm -hmm. revenues. I love seeing those results, but the best clients are the ones who are interested in learning about how humans tick. And they're really deeply interested in about how the mind works and in human psychology. Those are the people I love working with because they're insatiably curious. Mm -hmm. My mother, my great teacher of my life taught me to be insatiably curious about everything. Yeah, and I think that's, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, though, is that if you're going to be good at something, and in this case, it's sales, if you're going to be good at it, if you're not, if you're not insatiably curious, it's like if you're not, if, if you, if you're not interested in, in the business of business, in really understanding what's going on with the people that you're in, going to interact with, if you're not, if you're not um, interested in understanding yourself and how you can interact better, I mean, it, you're never going, to, you're never really going, to, you're going to hit a plateau very, very fast. Yeah. And plateaus are great for falling off of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Well, listen, uh, Paul, you know, we're coming up against the end of our time here and all of Paul's information will be in his contributor bio, but please do uh, tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you. Sure. I have a very active Facebook group. I'm in there at least once a week. We actually did a live stream today on mm -hmm. one fun tool you can use to double your sales. I do at least one live stream a week. We're in there constantly having discussions. It can get a little heated. If you want to join, <laughs> it's absolutely free. Go to speaker Paul Ross forward slash join group. Speaker Paul Ross forward slash join group. No cost to join. I do a lot of free training in there. It's my way of, of proving to people that this stuff works because it really is, uh, it's off the wall and bat bleep crazy. So you need a lot of proof. And I always say your best proof, your best guarantee, go out and try the stuff that I give away for free. But once you yeah. see results, then maybe you want to come back to me and hire me. But you got to prove it to yourself first because this is really, really outside the box. <laughs> Excellent. That's fantastic. All right, listen, Paul, this has been fantastic. Uh, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.